Oh, Graham, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, we're obviously going to be talking about uh, Alpine, uh, private equity, and your life in general. But for people who don't know, um, although I think most of the people who listen to this podcast do know you as uh, one of the best performing uh, private equity funds, tell us a little bit about Alpine. And don't go too much into history because we're going to cover it later on. What is Alpine today? We are a private equity fund. We do so software and services uh, investing. We're located in San Francisco. I, and I think one of the big things that's probably unique about us or that's really core to us is we're just really focused on talent and people. And that's really the driver of our returns. And it's where we spend our energy. And it's how we, you know, really how we built the firm. And it's it, it has worked. It's led to, you know, results, you know, better than I, I would have ever expected. So that that's probably the biggest differentiator for us. Yeah, that's that's quite brief. Like how big are you guys as of today in terms of uh, assets? Yeah, we're raising a fund right now that if we close, we should be around six billion of assets. Um, and we have about a hundred and thirty people total, including people that we've hired and then put it into some of the companies. Nice. And uh, one other thing I've read about uh, your fund is uh, something that you guys do differently is you have this program called CEO in training, right? What, what, what is that? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you uh, the origin of that uh, was when in our second, in our, in our second fund, we had a company and I, I, I guess I'm not supposed to say about performance specifically, but in our second fund, we had a company that was kind of performing. Okay. Not great. And one of the, uh, partners at Alpine said, Hey, you know, I'm going to go run this business. And he, um, he, he, he had been tired of trying to influence the CEO, the founder to do all these different things. And so he decided to call his own number and go in and run it. And, uh, and, and he went in and ran this business and within two years, you know, it was our best performing company by far. And it was, the best performing company in the fund, really the best performing company we've ever done. And it was really the only thing that changed was having this really solid leader. And the interesting thing about him, his name is Mike Duran. It was, he had actually never been in that industry before. He'd never been a CEO before. Um, and we realized just the power of having a really high attribute person who was going to run our playbook. So then we said, of course, we looked around and we said, well, we don't, what we, uh, we would be, we, what if we only had 20 more Mike Durans, you know, we would, we would have the most incredible performance ever, uh, but we had none. And so we really started thinking about the CEO and training program, which is, Hey, how can we start, um, a program where we're, we're giving, uh, young, hungry, uh, post MBA students, uh, an opportunity to become CEOs and training them in our playbook. So at the same time I was teaching at Stanford business school. And I'd meet with students and I teach a class on entrepreneurship and we can talk more about that a little bit, but I teach a class on entrepreneurship and I would meet with students and they would say, you know, Hey Graham, you know, I want to be a CEO, but how do I do that? And I'd say, you know, I, I don't know. I don't really know a good path. You go to a big firm, but it kind of takes forever. You could start something, but the success rate's really low. And so then we came up with this program and it kind of like matched a need that we had with really a big. Um, need the students had and and it took off almost immediately much better than i ever would have imagined and today you know we have um 65 people in that program and it's uh we have i think some of the you know the best ceos in in the world who who, who have come from that program and it's been uh it's been a real home run for us so those those are just um you said uh, mba students who graduated and are they assigned to other ceos or do they just is it classroom? What kind of training is that? Can you? Yeah. So they, uh, they get hired and they could come from any background. They could be from the military. They could be, uh, athletes. They could be, uh, from consulting, you know, really anything. And then they come, uh, they, they join in August after they graduate. And then they, we give them three months of, or sorry, three weeks of training. And then they join a company and they're reporting whether they're running an add-on that reports up to a headquarters or whether they're taking on a role at a, at a platform, they're reporting to a CEO who's been in our ecosystem for a while, knows the playbook. So they're learning that way, but they're learning by doing, they're right in the middle of it. We try, you know, they typically are, they're, they're having 
a P and L they're having hiring and firing authority right away. So they can start mm. really working on their, uh, on becoming a leader. And they're doing that with the oversight of a, of a CEO who's, who's, you know, really experienced. No, that's great. And I, I'm glad it's uh, working out for, for you and uh, for obviously the CEOs. So let's wind the clock back for a year. Uh, pandemic started, right? Uh, when did you realize that this pandemic is a big deal and how did it affect Alpine and industry in general? I thought that when we first sent everyone home, I thought we were sending them home for two weeks and then we all be back at work. Um, because I thought, okay, if everyone's home at two weeks, no one could spread the virus. So it must die out and then everyone will be fine. Of course, we all know that's not what happened. So I think that as the months started rolling and the numbers started climbing and then it started getting momentum, you know, then it was, it was pretty clear that this was going to be a real, a real major, um, disruption for the entire you know world and um you know we have we do two things at alpine we do uh software usually subscription software and then we do services and the uh you know both portfolios generally did really well um you know we there's a one of my investors said you know 2020 was the year you found out if you actually had recurring revenue or not and we we generally did. I mean, the, the the businesses that got impacted immediately were the healthcare businesses, because uh, the world um, the federal government basically shut down any non essential healthcare for I don't know what it was six weeks or two months. So those businesses were really impacted acutely for us for two months, but then they bounced back pretty quickly. And then we have one other business that does testing for like um, for students in schools that, that was impacted for probably a whole year. But outside of those, the rest of the portfolio really, you know, really held up pretty well. Um, and uh, I think, you know, as did a lot of the technology. It seems to me that the industry overall adopted quite well and quite quickly, right? How did you change your practices right after the pandemic started? And what did you start noticing on the market? You know, this is, uh, depending on how you count it, you know, this is the third or fourth recession that we've invested through. And I think the, uh, the thing you realize if you've, if you've been through a few is that, you know, the sun will rise, mm -hmm. the world will not end. And so we, you know, we plowed forward. Um, in fact, 2020, we closed more deals in 2020 than we did in any other year. So we, you know, we, we had a lot of add on acquisitions. We had a lot of acquisitions. We had a lot of sellers that we'd been talking to that maybe realized they weren't as bulletproof as they thought. And, you know, their business was doing fine, but they were, they were saying, oh, okay, I have all my net worth in one thing that, you know, maybe I should take some chips off the table. So we really, you know, we really plowed ahead. Um, and, and, and that, um, you know, in hindsight turned out to be a, the right move, but that wasn't, because we were brilliant, it was because we've been through a number of recessions and realized, you know, you don't, you don't need to panic in those times. And, um, and so, I, so, so I think we, you know, we, we, we continued pretty aggressively in, in our business. So uh, private equity and uh, software and services in general, it's quite crowded place. How do you guys compete with other funds and how do you win the deals? Yeah. Um, it is crowded and I've been in private equity for 27 years and every year it seems like it's more competitive than it was the year before. Um, we've been in a great market for 27 years, pretty much. It's been, um, one of the highest returning, maybe the highest returning asset class over that time period. So, you know, it's, it's been a good place to be. And because of that, it's attracted a lot of money and a lot of competition and a lot of really smart people. And, you know, great competitors. Um, so we, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're very humble. We had a very slow start at Alpine. You know, our, our initial, uh, performance wasn't, wasn't very good. And, and so we had, you know, we were, we ended up being becoming whether we liked it or not very humble and, and realizing we had to work really hard to, to compete and, and, um, and differentiate ourselves and do things differently. So 
the way that we try to think about it is what, you know, what is, what is everyone, what's the sort of standard thing that everyone wants? And we know we can't play there, but we want to sell them those businesses. Uh, but we want to be buying things that other people can't buy, won't buy, you know, don't have the inclination, don't have the time, don't have the resources, don't have the playbook, don't have the skills. Um, but, and, and, and so that's kind of how we think about it. Um, you know, there's Michael Porter, who's the author of competitive advantage, you know, the, the kind of godfather of strategy says, you know, strategy is really about being different, about unique, being unique, about making hard decisions and trade-offs and choices. So I'll give you an example of ours, you know, first off we, we buy recurring or reoccurring revenue only. Uh, so we got rid of everything that doesn't have those criteria. Um, we're not the only firm that does it obviously, but it makes it really easy just to kind of get rid of anything that doesn't have that. Um, and that helped us obviously a lot in the, in the, in 2020. Um, second is, um, we put our own team in place to run a company, our own management team in a hundred percent of the time in, um, platforms and about probably 80% of the time in add-ons. Most firms have right on the, you know, first page of their website, you know, we back strong existing management teams and, uh, you know, we do the opposite. <laughs> we look for businesses that have good businesses, but where maybe there's a management transition, maybe the, um, maybe the, uh, the, the team wants to exit, they want to retire. Maybe it's a corporate carve out where the business has been ignored by the corporation for a long time, or maybe it's a software founder who just, you know, doesn't want to run the business anymore. Uh, loved writing code, loved the early stages, but doesn't isn't the right person um, to take it to the next level. So we play in that space. And that is, you know, if you're going to change management, you have to have management. So that when I mentioned before, we have the huge, you know, army of CEOs and training and CEOs and residents to do that. Um, so that, that those are places we play that other people don't. And then we also just have a massive sourcing um, effort that that's a place in even today with all the competition, you can still differentiate quite a bit. And so we have a, we have a, I think we're, you know, as good as anyone or, or better uh, at sourcing. And we've, you know, we have 20 years of getting, of improving and, and working on, you know, uh, how, how we're finding deals maybe that other people aren't finding. So those are just a few things that we're, we're doing that are, I think, I think different. And for, when it comes to sourcing, is it just uh, your old fashioned cold calls to, businesses th that probably selling or you have some some know-how which you're not going to share with me anyway <laughs> no it's a it's a lot of things i mean we do corporate carve outs so those are old-fashioned cold calls but to corporations we have an army of buy side brokers that are out there hunting for deals in our industries for us uh we have sell side brokers who are showing us deals that they they know are in the market or maybe they're representing and then what you're saying, the cold calling, we have a whole direct team that does that. And that's cold calling, emailing. A lot of those intros are warm intros though, because we're in an industry doing add-ons. And so we know the businesses, you know, we have one or zero degrees of separation to the people we're reaching out to. They know who we are. So they pick up the phone. Um, so it's not, it, you know, there is, there is definitely some old fashioned cold calling, but there's a lot, a lot more to it than that. Got it. We're going to talk a little bit more about Alpine, but uh, before we, we do that, let's just go all the way back and actually learn about you as a person. So, sure. where did you grow up? I mean, where were you born and grew up? Yeah, so I grew up in a small town in Northwest Ohio called Perrysburg, which if you can believe it is a suburb of Toledo. <laughs> Toledo has suburbs and uh, it's really the Rust Belt. Uh, so, you know, uh, Toledo is, uh, effectively like was, and kind of still is a supplier to the automotive space. So doing, you know, that's why they say Rust Belt, you know, blue collar, uh, union type, type town. So that's where I grew up. Did you have any siblings? Yeah. I have a older sister and a younger brother. What was the dynamics between th uh, th uh, three of you? Because there's always one of you is troublemaker. <laughs> And two others are trying to, uh, yeah, stop. well, my sister was three years older and she got the brunt of it because she was a little bit of a troublemaker and she made, she made the path a lot easier for my brother and me because she sort of just blazed ahead and, 
uh, you know, by comparison, we were pretty easy kids. <laughs> My brother and I were 18 months apart, so we were joined at the hip and, you know, did everything together. What did your parents do? Uh, my mom, uh, she, well, uh, when I was really young, my mom stayed at home with us. Uh, later on, my parents got divorced. And so she had, she worked in fundraising, um, for the university of Toledo. And then, uh, my dad, uh, started his own veterinary practice, um, from scratch, taking emergency calls in the middle of the night, started literally with, with a zero clients, um, and built that over over the time that, you know, I lived at home. And so he, he was a, he was a veterinarian and, uh, and then when they got divorced, my mom, like I said, uh, got a job and started, um, started working. So you have the, some entrepreneurial gene from your father and fundraising uh, skills from your mother. That's, <laughs> uh, that's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. My dad worked super hard. Um, I mean, he, I give him tons of credit. He started this business for, with nothing and, um, he he just put the hours in i mean he uh he worked he worked as hard as harder than anyone i've seen even to this day and and did and was really successful eventually built built you know a really um a great a great practice but it took him took him a long time what did you learn from your parents when it comes to worldview and some other qualities that you think are important well, my, as uh, my dad, I just learned, yeah, the work ethic. I mean, he, he just, he just was very driven, put in the time, you know, never complained and, and was just, uh, you know, very entrepreneurial. And, and, you know, the other thing I kind of learned is he, he did really miss out on a lot of us growing up. Um, he didn't come to a lot of our events and, you know, he was just so busy with building his, his work. So I think that was w another thing I learned is I, I, I wanted to be a lot more present for my kids and they're, and they're, you know, growing up. My mom was really, she's the most optimistic person I've ever met. So she just, it was a force, you know, she just, she willed things to happen. She always thought things would work out great. Sometimes a little, you know, naively so, but more often than not, she, uh, she manifested, you know, what she wanted to have happen. And, uh, I think that's something that also really stayed with me. What's your favorite childhood memory? I'd say that in general, probably was uh, Christmas. My my mom just, you know, Christmas was a huge event and, you know, the family was together. My Some of my relatives would fly in. Um, you know, obviously, we were out, out of school. So probably those were, that was probably like my favorite like event that I remember year after year. Um, Gosh, if I had to have like a single memory, gosh, it's, it's, it's really hard to have like one, you know, one memory. I think just, you know, probably just spending time with the family, you know, be going on, on vacation. We used to go to the beach. We used to drive to the, uh, to the Atlantic ocean, you know, in the summers, that was probably my favorite when we were just, that was a big deal for us at, at that time. So probably that was my favorite. Did you have any hobbies? Um, I, I, you know, uh, like a lot of kids played sports, so, um, played kind of all the sports and then eventually ended up concentrating on tennis and wrestling, which is a weird combination, but, <laughs> but, uh, those are the two I ended up playing. And uh, how did you end up in wrestling? Because typical story is you just wanted to be able to stand up for yourself. That's what I see all the time, but what's your story? Yeah, my story was that I was in junior high school and wanted to feel like I was part of something, you know, a team. Uh, and I tried out for basketball and there, there were, you know, 40 kids tried out and they cut it down to 18. I made that cut and was feeling good. I ordered my shoes and everything. And then they cut it down to 15 and I did not make that cut. So I was one of the three last people cut and I was devastated. So devastated. Um, but I remember my, uh, you know, the coach was awesome and he was, he was really, um, I, I still remember like him telling me I got cut, but he said at the same time I had him, he was my uh, social studies teacher. And he said, Graham, you know, I, he just had a baby and he said, you know, Graham, if my baby turns out like you, I'll consider myself a really proud father. And he really meant it. And I, that was one of the nicest things he, someone ever said to me. And he said, you know, this, 
ultimately is going to be a real positive thing for you. Um, you don't know it yet, but it will be somehow. And he was so right because I, uh, I ended up then going to wrestling, which a lot of people who got cut did. Um, and wrestling was hard. Um, and I just, you know, I mean, it was really, really hard. Um, and, and I was, uh, I was decent at it early, um, and then got better as I started training harder and, you know, work getting up in the mornings and running and lifting and putting in the time I started, you know, getting, getting better and better. Did you compete? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, we had a great team in junior high. We won league both years and then I wrestled my, yeah, I, re I wrestled my freshman year on the freshman team, which all freshmen did. And then sophomore year, um, made, made varsity, uh, as a sophomore, which was, you know, again, for a kid back then was a big deal. I get to wear the gear around school on the days we had a, a meet and stuff. So that was, uh, that was fun. One interesting thing about wrestlers, uh, I, from my experience and a lot of time, one of the d most difficult thing about competition is the weight cut because wrestlers tend to uh, walk around one weight and then compete in different weight class. What was your weight, weight class? No, you hit the nail on the head. So like my sophomore year, I mentioned I made varsity. That was, that is true, but that's not the whole story. I made varsity like in the early tournament, the first tournament we did, but then the senior who was ahead of me cut to my weight. I couldn't beat him and the guy below him, I couldn't beat him. So I went from 145, which is where I started off. And the only opening where I could beat the guy was at 125. So I was walking around, I'm six foot one now, but back then I was 5'11 and wrestling 125 uh, and walking around at like, you know, 130. I mean, I was eating a thousand to 200 calories a day, which to put that in perspective, that's otherwise known as like four bagels, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and like, and, and just, you know, it was, it was super and working out twice a day. And that, that to this day, that's the hardest thing I ever did. In fact, I, I remember when we had this pizza party after we had that first tournament. So I wrestled varsity in this first tournament. And then they, they moved all the weight classes down and I was looking at this board. My name had gotten bumped off the board. So uh, the board had all the varsity people. And I look at that board and I looked down and, and I looked at 125 and I said, I could beat that guy. I know that. And then I was midway through eating this pizza and I like, <laughs> I pulled it out of my hand and threw it in the trash. Like that was the time when I committed to that. And I still remember that moment and it ended up being a really powerful moment for me because I had never really attacked something really hard like that before. And then like the intensity with which I went after that goal, like translated to the rest of my life. So I started attacking my, my schoolwork and my, um, you know, I had a job and I, I just like that. I, something like clicked and turned on for me, did that, like literally throwing that pizza in trash was like a big turning point for me. And then that carried over, you know, for kind of everything from that point on. So your school years, you basically were hungry all the time. I was, yeah. That's only I was way. hungry all the time. Um, and what, what, what really was surprising to me was, so my sophomore year, I made 125, had an unremarkable season because I was cutting so much weight. So I was, yeah. I was good. I made varsity, but it was kind of unremarkable. So you'd think, okay, I weigh in the last time my sophomore year. Okay, now I, I'm going to eat again, whatever, but that's not what happened. Like I, I just, I kind of developed sort of a, I don't know, attitude or even disorder about food. Mm -hmm. And I stayed around 130 pounds for the rest of high school. Oh, wow. I just, I just didn't, um, I don't know. I never, I never, I never really allowed myself to kind of eat enough after that. Um, until, until I got to college. So, uh, it was, there were, there were some big downsides to that too, but it was, yeah, it was an intense time for me. If I went to to high school with you, how would I describe you as a person? I I think that like if you were one of my friends, I think you'd say I was a little bit off, <laughs> you know, like no I think wonder. I was a little crazy. <laughs> I was a little crazy given some of the things I said. I think you would have said I was intense. I think you'd say I was kind of funny and didn't take myself too seriously and pretty easy to be around, but also like you know, a lot of a lot I I, I had like I had this gear and this drive that was 
pretty evident, I think. So I think you would have probably picked up on that too. Um, what did you want to be when you when you grew up? I think I wanted to be my dad. Um, you know, I think I think that that is a lot of kids. You know, they they look to their their dad, and I saw him start this business from scratch, and I wanted his approval. And so I think I you know I I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and and just be either work with him or do what he did. But um, I would go into his office and and help him. Uh, that was my job. I'd go in and you know I'd hold the animals while he would give them a shot or do whatever. And I couldn't handle it. Like, you know, he'd have some animal that had a broken leg and, you know, I'd be holding it and then I would just pass out. And uh, next thing I know, I'm like in this little break room, you know, kind of waking up. And then he would send me out to the parking lot to sweep just to get some fresh air. <laughs> he'd be like, okay, spend the rest of your day sweeping the parking lot. So I, I tried this over and over and I always ended up in the parking lot, either sweeping it or weeding the garden or something. So it wasn't meant to be, I guess. That's interesting though. Like you were a wrestler, you were basically fighting people, but when it come came to animals, you were almost like sensitive. Oh, it was it was so hard. I, yeah, it's funny because I loved helping animals, but I mean, really you see a lot of animals in in real trouble. Um so it was hard. Yeah, I I I I didn't do well in that at all. Then somehow you decided to pursue engineering degree. Yeah, so I I um at at that time in my high school, I don't know if anyone had ever gone to uh Princeton let, or even an Ivy League school, I'm not sure, but so I had to kind of pave that path and figure out how to, you know, that I needed to take the SAT and all all of that. I I ended up getting into Princeton, which I thought was I was blown away that they you know, I I thought that was just for like boarding school kids at that time but I, i i ended up getting accepted which was amazing for me i was it, i couldn't believe that and then i went to i went to princeton and, and uh i was going to be an english major because i love reading and i love writing and i was an english major but so my first thankfully my first semester i also took kind of just the basic core calculus and english and you know all the normal stuff and I had this <laughs> I had this English teacher where you know it was just so subjective it was like I'd write a paper and she would say you know I don't think you interpreted the author's use of the color red the right way or something <laughs> and I'm thinking what the hell are we talking about you know and then meanwhile in my calculus class I'm like there's a problem set I'd hand it in it'd be right or wrong and then I'd move on so I just like said screw it I'm going to be an engineer and uh that my mind worked a lot better for that. Uh I still love reading and writing. Uh as, as you may know, I have a blog and I I I write it on my own with my free time. It's one of my hobbies and I I love reading too, but um but engineering was better fit for college for sure. How did you end up on the um Rowan crew? Yeah, well, I'll tell you the story is so my the, the end of my wrestling story was um my ju- end of my junior year, I was in a huge match against my rival from another school was in front of our whole gym and you know it it in Perrysburg wrestling was like kind of we were good at wrestling we weren't great at a lot of things but we were really good at wrestling and so <laughs> they would turn off all the lights in the gym and have this mat light come down the, the gym was packed i go out there and i wrestle and i i lose um a close match i got i think kind of screwed on a call but that's neither here nor there and uh and i quit after that i was so devastated and i was so i i just quit and i didn't wrestle again that year or the following year and i i really really like regretted that i was so angry at myself i i just like for a year and a half i just sat with that so when i got to college i decided i was going to go out for rowing and i told myself at the beginning like there is no scenario under which i'm quitting <laughs> like i already felt how that felt to quit something like that and i wasn't going to do that again and thank god i made that commitment because i there's probably 250 times i would have quit <laughs> you know during the four years rowing was uh, it harder I, than wrestling when you compared <laughs> It wasn't harder. I just was worse at it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, I, wrestling, wrestling was harder because of the weight cutting. And in wrestling, you know, you're, you're 
you're spending all your time with someone who wants to kick your ass, you know? So it's, it was intense and, and rowing was intense, but I, I still think wrestling was harder, but, um, but I was just really bad at rowing, like in wrestling in seventh grade at wrestling, like everyone is kind of new and you're kind of figuring it out. But when I showed up to college to row, I mean, there's kids there that had been rowing for six years at that time. Um, cause they started junior high school and I'm starting, you know, my freshman year in college. And, um, so I was just really bad at it. So that, that, that's why I would have quit because I got cut, you know, didn't make the boat my freshman year. And then, uh, um, you know, had a long kind of a really long journey to get good at, at get good at rowing. But then you, uh, you end up being a captain, right? How did that happen? Well, the, it was interesting. It was, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story, which is that my freshman year, like in heavyweight women's and lightweight that each of them had probably 70 people go out for the freshman team, you know, which is like little, like almost 20% of the whole school goes out for one of these teams. So then they have like, they don't have what they don't have cuts per se. Instead they have, they just post the boats. Right. So they're like, okay, well we have two boats, i.e. 16 people, two coxswains and the other, the, the, and then they post the boats and you're like, not in the boat. Most people aren't right. And then they say, well, if you're not in the boat, you're a land warrior. And if you're a land warrior, you can use the ergs and, you know, row. And, you know, if you get better, maybe we'll, you know, you can get, make a boat later on. So I'm doing this math to myself and I'm like, okay, this is how many people got. So I got, I was a land warrior. Right. So then the next day I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing all the math and I'm like, okay, there's, you know, X, I don't know, hundred people that got cut and you know, everyone's going to be there before class. And my classes start at eight and there's only, you know, 25 ergs. So I'm doing all this math. I'm like, I talked myself into that. I need to be down at the boathouse at five thirty in the morning to beat the rush. Right. <laughs> So I get down there at 5 30 in the morning. Of course, there's no one there. I'm the only one there. I row, do my whole workout. No one shows up the whole time till eight. You know, by the way, the next day and the next day and the next day, it was me. But there was one other person down there, which is this guy named Mike Tatey. And Mike Tatey, uh, he wouldn't get there quite at 5 30. Maybe he'd get there at six and he would be rowing, you know, far on the other side of the room harder than I'd ever seen anyone row. And I would, uh, I would walk by his erg on, on when I was done and I would see the splits he was holding. I couldn't even hold those splits like one time. And he was holding it for like an hour. And I was like, who is this guy? You know, and there'd be this pool of sweat underneath them. So then sometimes we'd run into each other in the locker room and we kind of look at each other. And then finally, after like two or three weeks, he's kind of like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know, why do you keep coming down here? And I was like, And he introduced himself and I was like, well, Mike, you know, I'm trying to be the best rower in the country because I learned that you want to write your goals down and write, you know, I wrote down, I'm going to be the best rower in the country every day in my journal. And he just kind of looked at me like, are you for real? But then he's like, okay, well, let me just show you a couple things on the erg. Your, your technique sucks and you're going way too hard, you know, chill out. And, and then we would be down there, the two of us, you know, most mornings, just the two of us. And I didn't know this at the time, but Mike is maybe the most decorated U S rower of all time. And he's definitely the most decorated coach. Um, so I, I just got really lucky that he was the guy who happened to be down there at the same time. And he became kind of a de facto, you know, mentor and actually still is a friend to this day. And, uh, so he kind of gave me some tips on training and getting better. And then even once I made a boat, I still did those morning workouts. So I kept, I kept that intensity and, you know, by my junior year, I had one of the top ter top erg times in the country. And by my senior year, I had the top erg time in the country. And then, uh, and then, you know, was, was elected captain of the team. Our team won nationals. Um, and you know, so it had, a, it had a good, a good end of the story, but, um, but it was a long road that definitely I would have quit like 10 times. Uh, by the way, that story, ends up also being really important for Alpine later on, which we can talk about, but that, that, that was, that was a big part of why Alpine ended up surviving too. the same kind of idea of, of, of just kind of staying with it for a long time. Uh, that's interesting. We'll definitely uh, touch on that. So what was your first job after graduating? I went to, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley on wall street, um, was the, was, and I, yeah, it was where I went right after I graduated. 
was it investment bank or wealth management? It was an investment bank. I was in I was in the private equity group, but it might as well have been an investment bank. I mean, it was the same same kind of idea. And you've been I happen to be in private equity, but but it was at a big investment bank. Got it. So you've been there for some time, and then you decided to go back to to uh, college to get your MBA. What was the path? Yeah. So what happened is I um I worked uh for, I I let after after I left Morgan Stanley in before I got my MBA I went to work for these two guys and a recruiter called me and for whatever reason I ended up going to meet with these two these two guys who were starting this company and they were just really compelling I'd never heard of them I'd never heard of their company no one had they were just starting off but they were amazing and we together there were only three of us and we closed six deals in like 18 months that fund which wasn't really a fund it was kind of a pledge fund structure that ended up being a home run and then um those guys went on to be a firm called american securities which today is you know i don't even know 20 some billion dollars under management maybe even more than that and they they're one of the maybe the one of the best you know private equity firms um but i but again i was i didn't know who they were they i don't think they had any idea what they would end up becoming but that experience was awesome because I just got to be right in the action, you know, learn from these two amazing uh, people. And then I had deferred, I'd gotten into Stanford business school. I had deferred and then I tried to defer again, but the director of admissions called me and said, Hey, if you don't come, we're, we're going to act like, I'm actually not going to let you in again. And I could hear her in the background. She tore up this really nice <laughs> letter. I wrote her saying I wasn't coming back. And she said, I'm going to call you in two weeks. And you can tell me if you want to come. And I already made up my mind I was going to go. And so then I I went um, and it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a great experience. Why Stanford? Well, Stanford was the only school I applied to, not, not because it's, I mean, there's lots of great schools, but I didn't want to be on the East Coast. I didn't want to be in like the, I didn't want to be in the investment banker type mm -hmm. setting again. Um, I just, if I was going to go, somewhere and not get paid for two years. I wanted a bit of a different scene. Uh, and so I had gone to visit it and it was, it was a different scene. So that's, that's how I ended up there. I remember the story when I think you were still with investment bank and your mom came to visit, but you were so busy or doing some stuff that you didn't think was as important that you didn't have a chance to spend time with her. Yeah, that was, that was like my lowest point. So I'm a, I don't remember if I, I I think I was a first year analyst and, you know, at this point, my mom was a single mom. My parents had been divorced and, and um, she saved up her money to come out uh, and see me in New York, drove 10 hours from Ohio to, uh, to hang out with me for the weekend. And, you know, I'm working on some stupid project and my boss is there and, you know, his boss is there and we just were there all, all weekend. And I got to see her for like, total of four hours and she kept calling and saying, are you able to leave? You know, can't you tell them your mom's in town? And I remember getting upset with her being like, Hey mom, you know, you got to respect my job or whatever. And then, and then, you know, as I got, as I got out of that environment, I realized, you know, that was just ridiculous. Um, but you know, when you're in the middle of it, you don't, you don't realize that, you know, I like to say, you know, you really become your environment over time. And I became that investment banking environment quickly and absolutely you know and it wasn't really until i got out of that to go to business school that i um was really realized how how kind of far i drifted in terms of who i was as a person what did you learn at mba program that you didn't already know i, I mean i think that it was the biggest learning was just being exposed to so many amazing uh students professors, you know, concepts, ideas. It was like, um, you know, one of the kids in my, uh, students in my class was like a, a manager at Starbucks. Another one was a teacher. Uh, another one had started a business that had failed, but learned a lot. Another one, I mean, it was just, just being around all these different people from different backgrounds. And then the classes were just fascinating. I mean, a great class on marketing and uh, operations and um, behavior, uh, organizational behavior. I mean, I, just, I, it was just, it was just amazing to be in an environment where you're learning like that. Um, and then, you know, had some, had some really incredible professors. I was really lucky to, to have as well. 
uh, on your website on Alpine there is a list of people who who are your heroes and there are some of very recognizable names like uh, Warren Buffett uh, Steve Jobs Sam Walton and then Irv Grossberg and I believe he's a professor at Stanford right yeah that's right well I, yeah that's amazing you read that um, so Irv uh, for, for I'll say that there are probably hundreds of people that if you interviewed would say something very similar to what I'm about to say about her, but he, uh, I mean, is just a, one of a, one of a kind. I mean, he, he was a very successful entrepreneur himself and then started teaching and really built the center for entrepreneurial studies, um, at, at Stanford. And, you know, people used to say, you can't teach entrepreneurship and Irv obviously started the whole, now I think there's 63 classes on entrepreneurship at Stanford. Uh, he was my professor, and then uh, I became a case subject in his class, uh, talking about all the trials and tribulations that I had in starting Alpine. And then through that, I really got to know him. He and he became an investor in my uh, funds, and as well as just a friend. And then um, about eight or nine years ago, uh, he he said, Hey, I'm going to stop teaching this class. Um, would you want to start teaching it? And I was just blown away that he would ask me to do that and didn't certainly feel like I was, uh, ready for that. And certainly didn't feel like I could build those big, uh, shoes that he, <laughs> that he had. Um, but I also said to myself, you know, I'm never going to have this opportunity again, uh, to, to be invited to do this. So I, I took the leap and have been teaching there. But just, and we can talk more about that, but just go back to Irv. I mean, Irv, uh, as successful he is, he is, he's one of the most humble people you'll ever meet. And he um, is uh, very accessible and he's very giving with his time and his energy. And, you know, he's just, he's, he's got incredible advice and, and he's willing to help. And, so I just, it, he just was a, is a great role model to say, Hey, you can, you can have success as a, as a, um, entrepreneur and as a, as a professor and, you know, really give a lot back. And so I think he was really a model for me of, you know, how I wanted to show up as a professor, not, not like him because I'll never be like him. I have my own way I teach, but in terms of some of the ways he gives back to students. So you graduated from, uh, MBA and you started Alpine right away. Um, I actually took a job. Um, I chickened out and uh, I wanted to start Alpine. And then I, I just had all these fears and doubts and worries and all my classmates got jobs. So I did that. And it just wasn't, um, it just wasn't something that I, 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 I didn't have a lot of energy for. And, you know, I was using, I don't know, just, just not a large part of my capacity at that job. And it was a great, great people and a great firm, but it just wasn't a good fit for me. And so I, um, you know, I, I, I quit after about 18 months there and then started Alpine right after that. And when we say start Alpine, wh what was the process like? You just <laughs> sat down, wrote down the name and uh, like, how does it even happen? Like, who did you raise money from, et cetera, et cetera. Walk me through the whole thing. Yeah. So I, uh, um, I actually quit my job, packed up this crappy 1986 Volvo, which is my car at the time and drove out to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, which is where my ex-girlfriend from high school, from Perrysburg high school was living. And I was gonna try to date her. Um, that was my plan right there. And then on the way, uh, it's an 18 hour drive. I had this boom box and, uh, I had like a whole box of D batteries for it. And I had, um, 30 hours of Tony Robbins <laughs> tapes that I'd bought and personal power. And I'd heard those before. So I put one in and I start going. And by the time I showed up 18 hours later, I'm like, I'm going to start my own private equity firm. I'm going to like take over the world. You know, I was like all amped up. I mean, anyone who's going to listen to eight, you know, 30 hours of Tony Rob or 18 hours of Tony Robbins. <laughs> So that was literally what happened. I showed up and I was like, Hey, I'm going to start this. Fine. I have no idea how to do this, but I, I was excited. 
so thankfully the situation with my high school girlfriend worked out and we've been married now for 19 years. Oh, so that was a positive. That was great. And then on the, on starting Alpine, um, it was, you know, it was hard. I mean, not, not I mean, nobody will, I mean, imagine that you're, you're meeting a 27 year old who has no track record, who probably looks like he's 14. <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was a really easy no to say no to for raising money. And then, so everyone did say no. And then I realized I was going to have to talk to individuals, not institutions and was really, really fortunate that I had two, uh, individuals who believed in me, one of whom I'd kind of worked with before, uh, in another setting, he was on the board I was on when I was in, in private equity. And, um, so he had a little sense of who I was, but it was just a huge gift, um, of having those two back me. And that was how, how we got, how we got off the ground. Can you share how much you raised or? Yeah. The it? first fund was $54 million. So not pretty bad. Not, yeah, not bad by like, if you're I, I, year old guy. Yeah. Yeah. I was <laughs> thrilled. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, Steve Schwartzman's first fund was a billion dollars. So <laughs> I guess by that standard, you know, I didn't do that well, but, um, but for me, I was thrilled with that. I, I thought that was the more, more money that I could ever spend. <laughs> so it was just you. Uh, there's no, at the time it was just me, but then eventually uh, really early, I hired some, brought on some partners, um, who ended up being some of whom are still with me. What was your first deal? Our first, so, you know, if you're young, like I was like, I just didn't have really confidence in my ability to pick good businesses. Like I didn't know what a good business was, or I didn't think I knew. So I started buying stuff that was super cheap, just things that were like really, really inexpensive. So that first fund was really not good at all. We bought like a call center, which by the way, is not, um, a, a great business. We bought a commercial printer. Like we just, just didn't buy good businesses and, um, ended up not having good fund at all. And, uh, and then as, as we started living with some of these companies and these managers, I started getting a better sense of like what a good business is, what we're looking for. And then, you know, started improving quite a bit as we raised our second fund and, and beyond. What was the most surprising thing for you on running the P fund? Well, in the early days, it was just how hard it was. I mean, just, uh, I think what was so surprising to me in the early days is just how, um, some of the business school concepts that you read about, like particularly barriers to entry, some of the like real, like, um, academic concepts, like how real those were and that <laughs> how having a lack of those just crushed some of these companies. Um, so it was really surprising. It was like, I got another MBA, you know, in that first, uh, fund. The other really surprising thing, which I learned in the second fund was, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast was just how much impact one amazing CEO can have on a business like that. That was probably now that I'm saying it, the really surprising thing is like, wow, you're in the business of, of investing in companies, but even more than that, you're in the business of picking leadership. And if you buy a good business that has, you know, solid revenue and good prospects, then really the leadership is what's going to make it a great deal or, or, or a bad deal. So that, that, that was unbelievably surprising. And I sometimes think like, what do I believe about, you know, the world that not many people agree with me on? And I say that, you know, I think, if you buy a, a solid business, you know, management is 80% of the outcome is going to be the management team, which is probably way higher than most people would, would, would rank it. Yeah. That's interesting. And you mentioned that the your first fund didn't perform very well. Uh, but, but then you obviously had second fund, etc. How did you convince your, uh, investors? Did they, appreciate the way you work to turn the businesses around or what was the deal? Yeah, I think, I think it was a couple things. I think one, we worked super hard, uh, on turning them around. I mean, we, so they saw that. And, and then two is I was super transparent. So it, I, I think for years I was writing them weekly emails about like the sales and the pipeline and updates and what was happening just so they knew what was going on. 
the one of the two had his he was also in in finance not in private equity but in in public equity and he he had some early challenges in his business and so he kind of and it made him better and so i think he could appreciate that we were learning and getting better and and he appreciated the kind of honesty and transparency so you know once again i mean just so grateful that they <laughs> stuck with us and and gave us the opportunity because you know once we were able to get the second fund going um you know we we've, we've we've had you know we we've, we've sort of taken off from there how did opine change over the years outside of the fact that obviously you're a bigger company you have yeah. uh, more employees well, and more assets yeah i mean the i'd say the biggest turning point there were a few but they all happened around the time of like the recession it was like a bunch of a bunch of forces all happened around that time one is i hired an executive coach um which was phenomenal and i always recommend that to everybody it's probably one of the simplest life hacks <laughs> is hiring an executive coach because that coach really taught me that I'm a CEO and I, I got really like intentional about how I'm showing up, what, what my team looks like, what my goals are, you know, how we're working as a together as a, as an organization. And so that was amazing. You know, I, I, I slow. And then, and then similarly, I hired a husband and wife team that worked with us, our whole firm doing also coaching and consulting for a year. And during the combination of those two, I started realizing, Hey, you know, I'm not in the deal business. You know, I'm actually the leader of a firm and really we're in the talent business. I mentioned that before, like we're, it's more important that we get the talent right. than we get the deal right. Um, I mean, we have to get them both right, but I mean, if I spend my time building the talent, we'll get the deals right. And then um, and then setting some really audacious goals about what we wanted to do. And we'd set these create what would seem like these crazy ambitious five-year goals, but then we'd work backwards and have a real clear plan where we'd have five-year, one-year quarterly goals. The quarterly goals would all have individual accountability of exactly who's doing what every quarter. And then we'd reset that every quarter, every year we'd reset the one-year and the five-year goals. And we just got in the habit of doing that. And sure enough, we would hit our five-year goals in like two years. Wow. Um, and these were goals that we thought were ridiculous and we'd never hit. So we kind of got in that rhythm. And so all that happened around that, that time frame. Um, we started just getting good at running our own business, really, um, looking in the mirror and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're probably the most important portfolio company we have. So let's start treating ourselves that way. So that, that was... That was a huge turning point. And then after that, the turning points were really talent. So we brought on some really fantastic uh, people. And then each one of those were sort of turning points for us. Uh, when we spoke about rowing, you said that there are some parables that you actually used in order to navigate through some challenges. Was it this that you started treating the Alpine some certain way? Yeah, I think the parallel was like, I wasn't good at rowing for a long time <laughs> and then i got good at it uh and then i think i wasn't good at private equity for a long time and then got was got good at it so i think the the parallel was just like it's not about how good you are out of the gates it's about do you have a process for getting better and can you are you getting better can you can you see yourself you know quantitatively and qualitatively actually getting better and we were we were getting better in rowing. I was getting better at a really fast rate. And at Alpine, we were getting better at a really fast rate. So, you know, being able to kind of latch onto that versus where I start, where, what the starting point was, was, was pretty analogous between rowing and starting Alpine. Got it. At some point, you mentioned you will you'll start teaching at Stanford. And you are you still teaching? Because I saw some video where you were talking about the last lecture. Maybe it's for particular class but yeah yeah I, I i am still teaching the last lecture is just um a lecture i give at the end of the year i was invited to give at the end of the year but it's not not technically gotcha. my it's my That's, last lecture yeah. to those students but not my last lecture of all time um but yeah i still do teach at stanford what what did that experience teach you teaching yes well um I think that, I think that I, I, the class I teach is about entrepreneurship and we have, 
19 entrepreneurs come and they talk about different elements of building their business, hiring, firing, tough conversations, fundraising, um, uh, crises, all kinds of things like that. And I think in teaching that, I learn a lot from the entrepreneurs and then I have to create certain frameworks and certain, uh, you know, rule, not rules, but, you know, ways to takeaways from these different situations and how should you, how should you show up if this happens or that happens? Well, I, I, I'm the, I, I have to consume all those two, you know, so I would, I'll stand in front of students and say, Hey, you're going to have to have this tough conversation one way or another. Let's have it. Let's practice it, whatever. And then in my, and then at Alpine, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I got to have this tough conversation that I've been putting off. I got to get to this. And I, I really like have embodied the things I teach. I, I, I do not ever tell students to do something that I don't do or haven't done or I'm not currently doing. I mean, so the, I, I, I just don't do that. So I, it's made me way, way better CEO personally, but then the other thing is just, you know, the students at Stanford are just absolutely unbelievable, um, inspiring. I mean, they're, they're just incredible. I mean, what a gift to be able to teach a cohort like that. And, um, I learned so much from them and I also just get so inspired by them and what they're doing. I mean, they, um, I mean, if I, if all I did is invest in my classmates or my students, I mean, that would probably be like the best returning venture fund of all time. They're just so, uh, incredible really what they're doing. You're teaching, you have blog, you have Alpine. There is, I'm sure there are a lot of interests that you also pursue on the side, but also have pretty big family, right? Yeah. How do you, how do you combine all this stuff? I mean, you mentioned earlier, especially that you wanted to spend some time with your family and like your father who was very busy, but it seems like you had too many activities to balance it. How do you do it? Um, you know, it's, there's some, an, a few things. Uh, one is that there's some really natural cycles, uh, to what I do. So January through mid March, I'm teaching and, uh, and that, that is a busy time. And I'm trying not to take on a heck of a lot other than that during that time, trying not to travel much. Um, so that, that's a 10 week, really intense period. And, you know, I'm working nights and weekends during that time. There's just really no way around it. So I've kind of resolved that that's going to be my teaching time. That's just going to be tough, uh, and, and, and long hours. And it is, but it's rewarding and I get a lot of energy from it. Uh, but you know, I have 42 weeks of the year that aren't that. So, so teaching thankfully is pretty compressed, uh, and it is a lot of work, but it's pretty compressed. I teach another class in the fall, but it only meets five times and it's a pass fail class and it doesn't require as much prep. Um, but so, so that, that on, on the teaching part, it's just kind of hunker down while that's happening with my kids. I think that, you know, as as I've gotten older and they've gotten older, you know, I've been able to have more time at Alpine because, you know, we have a, a larger team now and I have people in key roles. So I'm not, you know, my cell phone is ringing at dinner with deals about to blow up like it did for the first 10 years. Um, so I have a little bit more uh, energy to give to them. Uh, and I, and I just, I just try to say, I try to say no to most things, except uh, things I think are really critical or things that I and only I can do. Um, and I try to be pretty, uh, ruthless with other things, not and just, and, and, and what I say ruthless, other people feel like it's empowering them. So if I say, Hey, you know, Joe, you've got this meeting. I don't need to be part of it. Like Joe shows up differently in that meeting than if I'm there, you know? And so I've gotten given myself permission to like allow other people to, you know, be empowered. And that's, I think allowed them to rise faster. And you know what? We're going to have times where they do something differently than I would. And I, I live with that, you know, and sometimes it's better. Sometimes it's not, but, um, that's been, I think that's, that's also what's allowed Alpine to grow is me giving up some of those, those things. Um, I am, I am pretty, you know, focused on time I get, you know, and, and, um, I don't, I don't have like, um, a ton of, a ton of things outside of, you know, work and family and teaching. I have a few, but I'm not, I probably keep that limited too. 
And if I asked your kids what they've learned from their father, what do you think they would say? Um, well, we do this thing on our birthday where the each, like if it's my, my birthday, each person in the family says something nice and then we keep going around. It's really fun. It's probably one of my favorite things that we do as a family. Um, so I'll tell you some things that they did say the last time we did that. Um, one of the high compliments that she, my oldest said is he said, you know, dad, you know, you, um, you're not projecting what you, what your own, you know, what you want onto me, you know, you're, you're getting excited about what I'm excited about, not about what you want me to be or what you were excited when you were my age and, you know, whatever college I want to go to, you're fired up. It's not what college you went to or want me to go to. It's what I want to do. And so I think he, he recognized, you know, as I thought pretty mature of him to recognize, because that is exactly how I try to show up, which is like, I I've, I've had my story. I have my, you know, I had my childhood, you know, they have theirs and it's going to be totally different. And they're all different than each other. They're all different than me and trying to like be there where meet them where they are and get behind them, whatever that is. Um, that's what I tried to do. And, and it was really nice to hear, uh, my oldest chase say that. Um, and I think beyond that, I do try to go to their, you know, as many of their sporting events as possible. We have family dinner almost every night. Um, you know, but they also see me work hard and, um, you know, uh, so I, I, I think that they realize I'm making a good effort to, to hang out with them and be with them. And, um, I'm sure I could, I'm sure I could do more, but I, I think that they would say something around like that. So Graham, next I have a quick blitz. So okay. I'm going to ask you a quick question and you give me a quick answer. Okay. okay. What's your favorite movie? I'm going to go vision quest. Vision quest. It's a wrestling movie. Uh, oh, okay. From the eighties. Gotcha. Uh, what's your favorite song? Uh, I would, uh, I, I, I'd say two songs. One is I See You Baby by Fat Boy Slim. And the other one is uh, We Are the Champions by Queen. Oh, look at that. What's your favorite book? Probably The Godfather. Oh, okay. What's your favorite sport, sport to watch? I got to go tennis. I mean, I, I've probably watched almost every Masters 1000 and Grand Slam quarterfinals on for the last 15 years. So I got to go with tennis. What's your favorite country to visit? Um, the my favorite uh, country to visit was the Netherlands um, and Amsterdam. That was uh, th that was probably one of the best trips uh, my wife and I took. Who's your favorite historical figure? I love um, Abraham Lincoln, and I love I, I, as much as he gets a lot of bad press. I I, I think Steve Jobs is just unbelievable uh I, I i really admire a lot of things about him what's the first item on your bucket list oh gosh um i'd say writing a book <laughs> what about uh I, I that's a great question so i i i write a blog and i write in my journal and i'm i i i hope that eventually something will kind of materialize from that i think i have some ideas but it's still a little bit early. Do you want to do it yourself or get a ghostwriter? Also good question. Um, I, I would probably want to team up with someone. I think just if for no other reason to hold me accountable <laughs> to getting it done. <laughs> so the final question, what life advice would you give to younger self? It's a great question. Um, and it's a question I kind of ask when I teach is, you know, what do I wish I knew? Uh, when I was at that age or even younger. Um, and the answer is that, you know, you're going to, you're going to be filled a lot with fear and doubt and limiting beliefs. And the simple thing is like, those are wrong. Like those are, those are not, you know, th th those are mostly not going to, you know, unnecessary. They're holding you back. You're going to overcome them in almost all situations, they're not serving you those fears and doubts and limiting beliefs. You feel like they are, you feel like they're 
they're guiding you and they're saving you, but really they're holding you back. And so that would be, that would be probably the one piece of advice. I, and as what it is a big theme of what I talk to students about too. Got it. Graham, thank you very much for the interview. It was great. Thank you.